uh, Mobius transformations, okay? So which are a kind of um, the basic building, the basic operations that are kind of the basic building blocks for studying the isometries of the hyperbolic plane later on. But there is something nice which one can sim one, that one can simply study them as some sort of automorphisms of the Riemann sphere. Right? Um, so I'm going to there there are there are at least two time two 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 equivalent ways of defining Mobius transformations. One, the one that you that I would say most people do is kind of just give the the for the, 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 the formula directly without just kind of without justifying where the formula comes from and another one which is trying to say you know try trying to motivate how the formula comes about so this is the, 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 it's the second approach the one I'm going the, the, the one I'm going to take okay so so linear algebra right? if you have a linear map, it always takes the image of a, sub, of a vector subspace of the domain is a vector subspace of the codomain, right? That's one of the uh, first things one can prove. Uh, and in particular, if I take a bijective linear transformation, uh, one dimensional subspaces from the domain are mapped onto one dimensional subspaces of the codomain, right? So, this means that every bijective C linear map induces a function from the complex projective line to itself. Right? Each one dimensional subspace uh, goes to, or I can, I can assign to it simply its image on the, the linear map, right? which is one dimensional because, because this is bijective. Right? If if my linear map were not bijective, then I, I would not be able to uh, I, I would not be always I, I would not I couldn't be sure that this is a one-dimensional subspace. Right? But it is because of bijectivity. Well, any function that I can produce this way, I'm going to call it a Mobius transformation. Right? So a Mobius transformation from the complex projective line to itself is simply the P1 shadow of a bijective linear map from C2 to C2. Okay. Um, of course, I, I, could, I, would, I, could say, I would say that while this is a, a conceptually very satisfying, uh, of course, at some point, we would like to have a formula. Okay. Um, but there are some, some uh, properties that, that one can immediately draw from the definition, and this 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 I, I will leave as an exercise, uh, and this is actually an exercise to be handed in next week. Okay, um, so every Mobius transformation is uh, continuous. Uh, this this you can prove from the from the kind of from just from the, the from how we defined the open sets of the complex projective line. Right? So re recall that we uh, by definitions by definition the open sets in P1C are precisely those whose inverse image uh, are open under the, under the tautological map from uh, from, uh, the no, from, the, from the space of non-zero vectors in C2. Um, right, what was this tautological map? Well, every such vector spans a one-dimensional subspace. Okay, so you know how, to def how, how this map is defined. Right? Okay, um, so playing around with that, with that definition, this, this becomes uh, uh, easy. Of course, uh, if I start with the identity transformation of C2, each one-dimensional subspace goes to itself. Right, so the Mobius transformation associated to the identity function, to the identity linear map, is the identity of the complex projective line. Uh, it's compatible with composition, 
right? So, so if I take two bijective linear maps and I take its Mobius transformation, this gives you the same as this com as, as uh, first taking the Mobius transformations and then uh, composing them. Right? This is, this is very easy given the definition we gave. And if you compare it with trying to do it directly with the formula that, that we will see later on, um, doing it with the formula, it's a bit more tedious. So somehow something we gain from, from, the, from the way we are defining Mobius transformations is, um, is this property and the, uh, and that it can be very easily proved. Um, well, Mobius transformations are bijective. Well, sure, right? I mean, uh, what would be the inverse of a Mobius transformation? Well, for sure, it's the Mobius transformation associated to the inverse of the original bijective linear map. Right? And I know this, I know this. Right? So, of, for sure, every Mobius transformation is bijective. Um, and, and, well, you see, like, a kind of, kind of the, uh, um, one can see that every Mobius transformation is a homeomorphism. Well, kind of just, just combining, just combining the first four, one obtains that it's a homeomorphism, right? Because we, if one knows that it's continuous and it's bijective, its inverse is also continuous. So it's continuous and set, sends open, sets in open sets, and it's bijective, it's a homeomorphism, right? So, uh, so I, I sort of sketched the solution of this exercise, uh, and uh, you have to hand it in next week, okay? Um, all right, and then from, from, from all of this, uh, what I obtain is that actually assigning to each bijective linear map from C2 to C2 its Mobius transformation, it's a group homeomorphism from the group of bijective linear maps from C2 to C2 to the group of self-homeomorphism of the complex projective line. Okay, so again, it's kind of, it's the proof of this theorem is pretty much this exercise. Okay. Um, okay the group of Mobius transformations of the complex projective line, mob of the complex projective line, okay? Group on their composition. All right, and now we move on to uh, exhi ex ex exhibiting a, an explicit formula. The way I'm going to, to uh, obtain explicit formulas is by considering uh, ordered basis of ordered basis of C2 right just just as in uh, in our courses of linear algebra uh, when we considered bases we could we could associate to each linear map a matrix right so kind of to each linear map some some something kind of numerical right that is kind of just one can see just explicit elements of the field or if you want explicit numbers, right? Rather than kind of thinking abstractly about uh, transformations. So I'm pretty, much, I'm pretty much going to do uh, what we did in linear algebra and kind of see the shadow in C bar. And that's how I'm going to obtain the explicit formula. So take an ordered basis, yeah, this B, We know that with respect to this basis, every element of the complex projective line can be written um, either as an, element, as, as an element of this form for some, uh, for some complex number z, or simply as the, as the vector subspace spined by V1. Right? So this, this we already saw. Okay, and now take a, a bijective linear map Right, because we want to consider uh, the Mobius transformation it, it gives rise to. Okay, and then and then we compute. Right, we want to we want to compute uh, the Mobius transformation. What the value of the Mobius transformation at this point of the complex projective line? 
right? So uh, at at the point at the point of the first type, let's say. So by definition, this is this is the image of the of this uh, of this of this subspace on the ref. F is linear, so this is equal to just simply uh, uh, taking f of of this vector and then taking the vector space it spans. Okay, uh, I use linearity right, because f of n, n f of this vector. How how can I obtain how can I compute f of this vector using using this matrix? Well. I, I form, I multiply this way, right? And then I get uh, alpha z plus beta on the first coordinate, and on the second coordinate, I obtain gamma z plus delta. Right? So this is what I obtain by uh, one of the basic theorems in the linear algebra course. And then I realize that here, uh, you know, I, I, I perform the same trick from last class, which is if this is not zero, then I can divide without changing the subspace, right? So that I, I present the subspace kind of in, in, in the standard form with respect to the basis. And if it's zero, then, then this must not be zero. Why? Because, because this matrix is invertible, or if you want it, because F is invertible. And so I can divide by this one, and uh, and then without changing the subspace, I obtain this. Okay, and this is for. This is then. This gives me then the value of the Mobius transformation at a vector subspace or an element of P1C of the first type. Then I move on to the second type, right? And then in the second type, do I do the same? the value of the Mobius transformation at the vector subspace, well, by definition, is the image of the subspace, but by linearity, it's enough to compute at any non-zero element of the subspace and take the subspace span by, by, the, by that evaluation. I do it, and then here it's, it's one, one V, so how do I obtain this image? Well, I, I multiply this matrix by one zero, Right, so I obtain uh, the coordinates are alpha and gamma, so here they are, and then I I, uh, I make the same observation. If, if gamma is not zero, I can divide by it, and if gamma is zero, then alpha is not zero, uh, so I divide by it, right. and then and then I obtain the computation of the value of the Mobius transformation at the point of P1C of the second type. Okay, um, right, so, so wh what I see is, you see kind of, you see, from the last lecture to each, with respect to this basis, to each point in C bar corresponds some, some uh, one vector subspace that can be, that can, one vector subspace that can be written in this way or this way. And so now I move on to compute on C bar, right? And then on C bar, uh, what I obtain is uh, uh, is this formula, right? And I mean, what I mean is the following: uh, take z in C bar. So if uh, if z is not infinity, if z in, if not it's not infinity, uh, that is if z is a complex number. Uh, which vector subspace corresponds to it under this homeomorphism? Well, this one, right? And in this one, we have computed, we obtained this one, this, depending on two possible cases. Whereas if Z is infinity, which one-dimensional vector subspace corresponds to it under, uh, with respect to beta? Well, this one. And in this one, we have performed the computation, right? The computation, right? And so this is what you are seeing here. Right? And at the very end, what I do is, uh, is 
I just go back to C bar. So I just keep either this uh, number or in instead of this, I, I uh, keep infinity. Right? So I, I just go back to C bar. And so, so, so these two computations become simply this. Okay, right? So you can see here if, if Z is not infinity and the two cases from before, and if Z is infinity and the two cases from before. Okay. Uh, this, this looks a bit ugly in the sense that, that, uh, that what I, uh, kind of, I don't want to have these four expressions, right? Somehow the one that dominates is really this one because somehow you see, in C bar, in C bar, there's only one point. There's only one point which is infinity. All the others are in Z. Are, are in Z. Right. So somehow, this this case really is the one that dominates in the whole in the whole C bar. This 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 is kind of just for this exceptional point. Okay. So almost always you have this rule. Okay. But then. But then, uh, how many z's in C satisfy that gamma z plus delta is equal to zero? At most one, right? Because gamma z plus delta, it's a linear polynomial, right? It's linear if gamma is not zero. If gamma is zero, then no z satisfies that. So, in all the, what I'm trying to say is that among, among all these four conditions, um, there, are, there are at most two exceptional points, which are z equal to infinity uh, or z or, or complex number z, which is root of this polynomial. In all the other cases, you can apply the first one. Right? So, so really the, for, the formula is really the first one. These other three cases are really kind of exceptional. Okay, and then one, say, one says, okay, yeah, but they are exceptional, but, but notice. Uh, if this is zero, somehow this is zero, and then and and this is not zero. So if you define complex number divided by zero to be infinity, you obtain the first one. Uh, and in these ones, if you just go with uh, with what you learn in in, in uh, complex analysis, which is that that uh, that the limit of of the quotient of two polynomials is simply, you, you, you see, it's kind of, uh, it really is, you have, you have your two polynomials. If they have different degrees, let's say that this one has degree less than this one, then this limit, this limit is zero. If this one has degree greater than this one, then this limit is infinity. And if their degrees are equal, then this limit is simply the, the quotient of the leading ter of the leading um, coefficients. Okay. So if you just go with that and say, okay, p of infinity, you, you see, you see, kind of whatever value of this at infinity, infinity, just go with with uh, with what we learned in um, in complex in complex analysis. You precisely obtain uh, obtain uh, sorry obtain these ones. Okay, so, so we just adopt these conventions, and if we adopt these conventions, what we see is that that the result of, of pulling of pulling back our computations from P1C to C bar gives us simply this formula, okay? which is kind of the one that I guess well, I don't know if you have already seen, but that kind of this is the, the, the famous formula, right, of Möbius. Okay, and then, then I will simply use these conventions. Right? I'm not going to divide infinity by infinity by zero, or infinity by infinity, or zero by zero. Uh, I'm just going to, dif to, to, to divide non-zero complex number by zero. That, that, I'm, uh, that, that I'm going to do, and, and that's it. And, the, and then whenever I want to evaluate something at infinity, I'm going to go with uh, what the limit di di dictates me. 
All right. Okay, and so, well, this suggests that, that maybe we could have started the other way, right? Kind of, instead of going through P1C, just go directly to, uh, to C bar and just and simply define every time you have an invertible matrix, um, just, just uh, define a function according to this rule. Right? But what I, what I wanted you to see is that this famous formula is, uh, is, is just the, it really comes from linear algebra. Um, and so, so kind of, so there, there is, there really is no mystery in, okay, why, you, why do you divide? Well, you divide because when you decide to work with respect to a specific basis, uh, this division by the second coordinate gives you a, a kind of a, a, a parametrization of P1C. Okay, kind of a, a, a normal form for it, for its elements. Okay, and so so any function from C bar to C bar of this form, I'm going to call it a Mobius transformation of C bar. All right, and then then we of course have a relation between um, Mobius transformations of P1C and Mobius transformations of C bar. Right, we can pass from Mobius transformations of P1 to Mobius transformations of C1, sorry, not C1, C bar, uh, by uh, choosing a basis for C2, right? And writing everything in terms of that basis of C2. Uh, are there any questions so far? Uh, is it, is it, is it, has everything been clear? Is it, so, so it's not too hard? It's not too abstract? Okay. Is it too easy? Okay. Um, you see, I mean, am I going too slow? Okay. All right, and then, um, and then uh, we're going to start studying Mobius transformations kind of in two steps. Today I'm going to start to, to start with the easy examples, well, the, the standard examples. And in the second step, I'm going to, 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 study, um, to study all Mobius transformations. Uh, and I'm going to put, I'm going to study them in terms of their relation to the standard examples. Okay. Because uh, kind of, of course, we, 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 by now we know some functions, some complex functions. Right? And there is, of course, the, the natural question of from these functions, are, which ones of them are Mobius transformations? For instance, kind of the, 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 the standard ones would be like sine, cosine, exponential. Right? Or... Uh, Logarithm, but logarithm is multivalued. Uh, that logarithm, logar logarithm is not going to be a Mobius transformation. Okay. Um, sine, cosine, and exponential. Um, they are not Mobius transformations. Um, so can any can can someone give me the argument as to why the sine is not a Mobius transformation from C bar to C bar? Okay, um, and so 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 in particular from the uh, well another, another sorry another example of 
fun of functions that are not Mobius transformations is any, all the, any, any polynomial function of degree strictly greater than one cannot be a Mobius transformation for the same reason. Um, okay, this is this is easy when it has two di two different roots, and then I li I leave it to you to think when uh, you know when it, when it, it may have only one root with multiplicity uh, greater than one. Okay, but so the among the polynomial functions only the ones that have a, a degree one have the chance of being a Mobius transformations. Right? So this is going to give us our first uh, standard example, our, ex our standard examples, right? So, yeah, okay, yeah. So, uh, a, a polynomial of degree one, so let's say alpha z plus beta with alpha different from zero, right? Um, of course, the rule at the level of C bar, well, on complex numbers, we know, and then at infinity, as we, as, as I said, you take limit, you obtain this infinity. And you see this is, of course, equal to this Mobius transformation, right? I mean, when you take, when you take the expression corresponding to this one, what you obtain is um, Z goes to alpha Z plus beta divided by zero Z plus one. So this is just alpha z plus beta, right? so which is precisely this. So, so polynomial of degree one give, is a Mobius transformation, uh, and moreover, uh, this matrix I can uh, factor it this way. And this is, I would say, obvious. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to study separately. The Mobius, this Mobius transform, the Mobius transformation corresponding to this matrix, and the Mobius transformation corresponding to this matrix. Um, notice this one give, gives me a translation, right? Because it, there's a one here, so it's so there's a one here, so Z is simply translated right to Z plus beta. So, so, it, so it kind of it it it. it it looks like, a, you know, if beta is here, it looks like a translate to beta and then infinity is fixed. Right? Okay, so let's start with uh, some um, very easy observations about translations. Um, as I said, infinity is a fixed point, right? And the translation gives me the identity precisely when, when the translating vector is zero obvious another obvious thing is if i you see I, I i consider my i consider my um my translation vector beta and well this this line right the kind of the the oh, okay this is not very well drawn but um of course this one is stable under repeated uh, applications or iterations of the translation, right? But and not only not only not only iterations of the translation, but also also of the inverse, right? Kind of translating by minus beta. So this so so this that one uh, that that line that line is stable on their all integral powers of the translation by beta. Eh, but also all parallel lines to that, right? All, all the lines that are parallel to that one are um, stable under the translation by beta. Uh, so that, that's obvious. And then if I, f if I take any other, any vector which is not parallel to beta, uh, and then I consider all the, all the lines parallel to my new vector, not parallel to beta, uh, then you see, I mean, then, then these lines, of course, this, this, such a line is not stable on the translation by beta because it's really completely moved, right? But it's moved into another line of the same family, right? O which is also parallel to my vector, not parallel to beta. And if I take another member of the family, 
its image, well, it's not itself, it's not stable under, under, under translation by beta, but it's another member of the family. Which family? Again, the, the, the family of lines parallel to my, to my vector that I fixed, not parallel to beta. Right? So this would be this, this vector beta prime. Um, and so, so here, while kind of the considerations I've been making are pretty much trivial, uh, what I can uh, state is two, two facts that are, going, that are really going to have far-reaching far consequences. There is one family of curves in C-bar, which is uh, each of whose members, so each of whose curves, is stable under all integral powers of the translation by beta. So there is a family of curves, each of whose members is stable under the subgroup generated by the Mobius transformation, by this single Mobius transformation. And there is another family of curves in C bar, uh, where, which, which has some sort of transverse, transversal property. Right? Now, each member of this other family of curves, now it's not stable, not at all, but it's moved, its image is another member of the family. Um, so here you can see both families right, drawn together. One, two more properties of this family. Um, two more, no, only one more. For any of the two families that, that, that I just mentioned, if I exclude the fixed point, which is infinity, every other point belongs to exactly one member of the family. I mean, here you see, I mean, every point which is not infinity belongs to exactly one member of the family every point which is not infinity belongs to exactly one member of the family. Right? So what I would say is that these two families foliate C bar minus the fixed point. Okay. Um, and now let me move on to uh, multiplication by a non-zero complex number. First, I find the fixed points just as, it, as I did in the case of the translation. It's obvious that the, the fixed points are precisely zero and in, at infinity. Right? It's obvious that they are fixed points, and I would say it's also obvious that they are the only fixed points. Um, second, if, I, if I'm multiplying by alpha, of course, multiplying by alpha is the identity function of C bar, if and only if alpha is one. Uh, and moreover, since because of this property, um, no, forget about what I just said about this property. I mean, direct computation shows that, uh, you know, multiplying by alpha repeatedly is kind of, is of course, multiplying by alpha repeatedly. Right? So this is here. I have an obvious uh, equality, um, and this matrix is obviously equal to this matrix. So I have, I have this. Okay. Uh, in other words, computing the end power uh, of the Mobius transformation uh, is equal to the Mobius transformation of computing the end power of the matrix. And, and I would say it's really easy. Right? Okay, and now I'm going to uh, to perform kind of a basic geometric analysis of a basic analysis of the geometric behavior of the of the powers of the of the of the Mobius transformation multiplication by alpha, similar to the one I did for translations. And now the point is, the, the, the here kind of the, the, this basic analysis is going to 
to be a uh, um, different depending on where in the plane my alpha the the complex number by which i am multiplying lives uh, and so the 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 four kind of the four places where zeta may live where z may live not z i'm sorry where alpha may live um, that have a direct impact on the geometric behavior of multiplying by alpha are this that alpha may be the identity in which case we know multiplying by alpha is the identity so there's not there's not much to be said when it's a positive real number of course different from one when it lies on the unit circle but it's different from one and the rest right and then you can see all all of these are are pictured here right i mean um of course here's complex number one real numbers different from one uh, elements of the unit circle but different from one and the rest um, okay so I'm, I'm i'm going to start with uh with this part um, so i take my uh take a positive real number and obvious right when i take a, pos a positive ray so in other words if i take if i take a vector here if i take a vector and i consider its positive real multiples so the positive rate spans um, of course that one is uh, stable under multiplication by alpha right obvious um, and not only not only by multiplication by alpha but also by multiplication by all int integer powers of alpha right so by, it's stable by multiplying by alpha then alpha square alpha cube etc but also by multiplication by uh, alpha inverse alpha alpha to the minus two alpha to the minus three etc and all of that is obvious i would say so each of these rays is stable on their multiplication by alpha etc um, and then i have another another obvious family which is the cir the circles with center at the origin right? and this this have kind of a, the, this this family of circles has the same property like the second family i encountered in the in the case of translations right i mean now i consider the set of all circles with center in the origin and if i take one of them and i multiply it by alpha by, uh, alpha different from one so here um, the image is not itself but it's another member of the family um, okay so eh, some some uh, some properties that uh, okay yeah the, that they, they they actually are important so let me let me let me uh, tell them right so, so if alpha is greater than one then when i start multiplying with alpha i really go to infinity right because i start getting big 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 i mean alpha to the end starts to getting arbitrarily large so it goes to uh to infinity right? so this limit is always infinity provided i don't start with zero and infinity um if alpha is less than one uh, when i start multiplying by alpha repeatedly um, uh, alpha to the end starts to 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 to, um, to become smaller and smaller right so the limit is zero right so depending depending on whether alpha is greater than one or smaller than one um, the 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 iterations of alpha at a, at a given z either just goes to infinity or goes to zero uh, and here one has if and only if in both right so what i mean is if actually this happens then alpha is greater than one or if this happens then alpha is smaller than one okay um, 
So once more, we have um, we have this. Uh, we encountered, we found two families of curves. Right? In the first family, every every curve in the family is uh, stable on their all integral powers of the Mobius transformation. For the second family, um, a, a, each member of the family goes to another member of the family. And finally, if we consider C bar minus the fixed points, which are zero at the, and infinity, each point in C bar minus the fixed points belong, it lies on exactly one member of the family. Right? It doesn't matter if I take the family of stable curves or the family of permuted curves. Okay, and, and it was again like really easy, I would say. Um, and now I'm going to go with uh, the next case, which is this one, which is when I take my alpha to lie uh, on the unit circle. And of course, what I obtain is a rotation. Uh, kind of one way to see that one obtains a, ro or a rotation when multiplying by such alpha is kind of just using this uh, form formula of the Moivre. Right? Um, so it's, it, that's, uh, that's quite easy. And again, kind of I'm, I'm looking for curves, right? So I'm looking for a family of stable curves and I'm looking for a family of permuted curves. Again, very easy to find. Right? Circle centered at the, uh, any circle centered at uh, the origin is stable on the rotation. And now, if I take uh, the straight lines through the origin, um, or if you want a positive ray, uh, the ima its image on the rotation is another positive ray. Or take a line, straight line through the origin, its image is another line through the origin. So I have my two families of curves. And again, if I exclude the fixed points, which are zero and infinity, every point in C bar minus the fixed points lies on exactly one member of the family for each of the two families. Okay, so I, again, I, have, I, I obtain again two foliations of C bar minus the fixed points. Okay, some exercise, right? kind of rationality of the of rotation, uh, and then the kind of the, the trickiest case, which is the rest. This is going to be the the trickiest case, and which is this one. And before jumping into it, notice that so far kind of the easiest case, which was the identity, is, it was kind of, is given by a zero dimensional set, just, just complex number one. This other one, um, homothetis, is a one dimensional set, one dimensional set, and all those cases were kind of not tricky, and translations, well, okay, you can say translation is a two dimensional, well, okay. In multiplication by alpha, uh, these the kind of the easy cases are come from from one dimensional. Um, I don't want to say subspace from one dimensional uh, subsets of uh, C, and the trickiest one is dense in C. All right. Uh, if what I just said didn't make sense, forget about it. Okay. Um, I, hopefully, at, at some point, it will make sense. Um, so now, take take uh, take any alpha, uh, not the, the any alpha that we have not considered so far, right? So, so a complex number different from zero. So this this when I when I write this, 
this C with, a, with this uh, cross, it's really the, com the complex numbers difference from zero. Okay. Um, okay, but but uh, take any such, but not not uh, not uh, not a positive real number and not lying on the unit circle, right? So really the rest, right? um, and write it uh, write it in kind of a you know in how do I say it in this uh, you know it's it's alpha it's uh, it's norm times the exponential of its argument. Right? So write it that way. Um, okay, and now kind of recall that, I mean, somehow somehow by now it, it, should, you, it should be expectable or you should be already, you should know what I'm going to do. I'm going to find, to try and find two families of curves, each one with some behavior and each one uh, foliating c bar minus the fixed points that's that's what i'm what, that's what i'm going to that, what when i'm at when i'm trying when i when i'm that's what i am what i am going to try to do okay um after giving it some thought you one realizes that uh for each point in the circle one is going to, one needs to define a curve right so take a point in the circle and with this point in the circle i'm going to define a curve on c bar minus the fixed points the curve is you know it's simply gamma gamma s of t well it's simply alpha to the t but rotated by s so that's the curve. So if you want uh, to begin with, if you want, just take one, right? So just take one. So it really is, so, so this gamma one of t is just alpha to the t. Uh, and then, let, and then, can, then just draw it, right? And then if, if alpha is greater than one, uh, if, it, if the norm of alpha is greater than one, well, what, what happens? So, so here I'm, and uh, first I'm thinking if you want s is that s is equal to one and you see what happens is that here I mean you, you start winding around uh, but you start but the, the, the norm starts to get bigger and bigger right. um, so you get this behavior, right? I mean, you start winding around, but far, uh, but farther and farther away from the origin. And actually, actually, uh, somehow one gets uh, one gets far away from the origin very fast, actually, because because it's uh, it's exponential. So somehow 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 this picture is not not fully accurate because it's kind of it, it goes kind of very slow. But anyway, um, and and. Uh, if on the other hand alpha is less than one, not alpha, the norm of alpha is less than one, same thing, you start winding around right, in the counterclockwise direction. So for for me it's this, so for you it's this. Right. Uh, but alpha, but its norm is less than one, so you start getting close to the origin. Right. So counterclockwise, and you get close to the origin. Right. And these are kind of, the two possible uh, situations. Right? Um, here you are. You can see kind of. You see if, if, if this is this this is the picture in C bar, uh, and then if you ask uh, yourselves, you know, like okay, but what if I want to see it on the sphere? Right? I mean, I, I know that that uh, there is these stereographic projections between the sphere and the and C bar. So, so how does it look like in the sphere? And this is more or less how it looks like. Right? Yeah, by the way, I, this, I, this I took from the internet. Um, but yeah, but I, 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 um, I forgot to, to, to include where I took it from. Sorry, but, uh, but so, so this is, this is, this is, uh, this is how the curves look like in the sphere. And the, 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 um, Right. Okay. So, 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 so. After making that consideration for alpha to the t, 
for an arbitrary element of the circle, well, of course, it's kind of the curve we just described. You, you just rotate it, right? Uh, and if you think about it, when you you see you you, you have your you, you have the curve I described for s equal to one, it's just one curve, and when you start rotating it with with s, you cover the whole you cover the whole plane, right? So. Um, Okay, uh, and actually, um, actually, you see, the Moab's theorem tells me that actually, if I take, you, you see, if I, uh, if I take one element in one of those curves, one point in one of those curves, and then I multiply it by alpha, because I want to study its behavior by multiplication by alpha, right? I want to see that these curves are, invar are stable on their, on their multiplying by alpha. So if I take a point in a curve and multiply it by alpha, by the Moab's theorem applied to this expression, one can see that it's actually equal to the value of the curve at, at t plus 1, at time 1. So multiplying by alpha lies again on, this, on the same curve. So such a curve is stable. On their, at least on their the positive powers, but you can easily see that it's going to be again uh, stable under the negative powers. Um, okay, so we found a, the, a family of curves, each of whose members is stable on their the integral powers of multiplying by alpha. Um, and as I said, how do I cover the whole plane? Well, by taking by taking and just kind of rotating with. Uh, with uh, along the circle along the circle right what i'm what i mean is rotating but kind of just just kind of just do it once and that's it you obtain the whole plane all right and then other families right families of uh, of uh, permuted um curves uh well that that that's that's easier for instance, take uh, circles centered at the origin, right? You take one circle centered at the origin. When you multiply by alpha, is you multiply and rotate, but it's a circle centered at the origin. Uh, so the family of circles centered at the origin is a family of permuted curves. You can also say, uh, there's another family of permuted curves, straight lines through the origin. Take one, one such line, multiply by alpha. It's again one such line. So in this case, uh, we have, we can choose either of the two families to be a, a family of permuted curves. And each of these three families, this, 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 uh, this type of curves, the circle centered at the origin or the straight lines again if uh, if I take C bar minus the fixed points every point in C bar minus the fixed points lies in exactly one of these curves okay now what's the name of these curves and kind of some geometric property that they satisfy right um, well, they are called loxodromes, and they are kind of loxodromes connecting zero and, it, and infinity, and, and associated to alpha. If I change the alpha, something happens. Um, and you see the theorem, the, the kind of the a geometric property they satisfy, is that when you consider all the circles cent centered at infinity, all the circles centered at zero. Uh, And you, con and, and, and you consider the angles at which any, give any such given curve intersects those circles, it's always the same angle. So let me, let me show you. Uh, so it's here. Yeah. So 
here you see here I have a, I have it's actually two locks of rooms. Here you can see one, right? and the other one is is uh, this one. And what the theorem is saying is you see, what, look at this angle. Right? Look at this angle. They at least look the same, right? I mean, uh, of course that's not a proof that they are the same, but they are, they kind of they look. This one looks the same as this one looks the same as this one, looks the same as this one, looks the same as this one, looks the same as this one. You see, at least, at least it looks like, uh, like all, you see here kind of, it, it's more clear, right? That he, here it looks like, a, like this, uh, like this uh, theorem of Thales, right? That, that they are, that they are all, well, anyway, don't, never mind. Um, and what, what happens is that, that okay, so, so when one moves alpha, that angle changes, okay? Uh, I don't show it now because, because somehow uh, um, my program has some bugs. So, so if I move the alpha, uh, I, things may be messed up. So I prefer not to show it. Um, and so he and in the sphere he, he, in the sphere somehow what you see is kind of it's, it's this is those angles right so this angle and then uh this angle right and then this angle and the theorem is that all those angles are the same um yeah and the proof so let me see okay so uh so let's uh, let's have a look at the proof because we we are we are almost done for today. Um, so consider uh, just one a fixed real number, right? So before to define to define each curve, I fixed s. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to fix t. Okay. Is that what I'm going to do? I think so. Um, the point is that for t fixed, multiplying by alpha to the t is holomorphic. Uh, it's holomorphic and with non-zero derivative, right? It's 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 uh, its derivative is alpha to the t. As as a function as a function of z, its derivative is alpha to the t, which is non-zero. Okay, so it's it's holomorphic with non-zero complex derivative, hence it's conformal, right? I mean. Uh, The Cauchy Riemann equations, what they really tell me, well, one of the things they tell me is that um, when I consider the derivative as a linear map from the tangent space to the, to the point at which I'm taking derivative to the tangent space of the image, that that, 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 that linear map as in differential geometry, uh, is multiplication by the derivative, so multiplication by alpha. So it preserves angles. That's that's what it means to be conformal. Um, or if you want the 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 correct definition of conformal is uh, that the derivative, when seen as a linear map, is a is a positive real multiple of an orthogonal matrix. An orthogonal matrices preserve angles. Okay. That's that's it. I, I mean and pretty much the rest is blah blah. I mean that's that's pretty much the right I mean kind of the the proof pretty much ends there. Um well ends there and, and and it's an, it ends there, but all, I mean, kind of taking into account what I said before, the image of a circle centered at the origin is another circle centered on the origin. And, 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 and the image of the curve, you know, uh, uh, it, the, the image, how to say, the image of set by alpha to the t is, lies, lies, lies there, in, but it in, lies in the same curve. 
So the original angle is equal to the resulting angle. Right? So I'm already using the fact that, that the image of a circle centered at the origin is another circle centered at the origin and that each loxodrome is invariant, is stable by multiplying by alpha to the t. Okay, but pretty much the point is this. Okay, and so just, just to finish, uh, some summary. I would say that except for the last case, which was the, these uh, loxodromes, you know, when alpha lives outside the positive real numbers and outside the unit circle, um, except for that, all the analysis was very simple, I would say, very simple-minded, very easy, very, you know, there, there was no mystery. And, but, but, but I could extract some special geometric facts. In every case, I could find two families of curves, in some cases more, right? But in all cases, two families of curves The first family consisted of curves, each of which is stable under all integral powers of the Mobius transformation. The second one uh, is kind of has the kind of the transversal property in the sense that uh, for the second family, each, each curve member of the family is mapped onto another member of the family. And moreover, each of these two families has the property that if I delete the two fixed points, every other point lies in exactly one curve on the family. Um, so, so while it was, I would say, very easy to study this in, the, in, the, in these uh, standard examples, um, no, I have to say, it was very easy to establish these facts in the standard examples. And, uh, and then in the next lecture, what we are going to do is we are going to realize a few facts. We are going to collect a few facts and then, um, and then we are going to, to take an ar arbitrary Mobius <coughs> transformations in a way, kind of in a kind of tricky way, we are going to map them to a standard, to a to a well-defined standard example, and then we are going here. We are going to have already the geometric facts, and then we are pull them. We are going to pull them back. Um, okay, and some homework. Yeah. So uh, uh, as I said, uh, for next Wednesday. Uh, this one, like uh, prove the basic properties of modest transformations of P1C. And then see you on Monday.